Welcome to Nerdist Book Club, live on Nerdist and Geek and Sundry's YouTube, as well as Geek and Sundry's Twitch. We are the bigger, better, freer version of Alpha Book Club. If you watched us before then, thank you so much for joining. If you're new, also thank you. I'm Rachel Hine. Uh, I, I am the editor-in-chief of Nerdist.com, and joining me, as always, are Geek Bombs Mod Garrett. Hi! How do you going? How do you do, uh, MDC Daily Sector tomorrow? I can't believe we're finally doing it. We're doing it, off. baby. I didn't yeah. think, guys. I just had to. I had to see you stumble so that I could <laughs> <laughs> nail. I know. The I was happy for that to be my role. Mm -hmm. I was thinking mm -hmm. about it as well. Um, so, if you have not joined us before, thank you again for joining us. This is our online live book club where we discuss all of our favorite nerdy tomes with you while enjoying refreshing beverage. Speaking of refreshing beverages, <laughs> we were sent some really delicious wine um, by the Hideaway Wine Company. So if you're of drinking age, which is 21 and over in the US, um, make sure that you head over to www.thehideawaylo.com. It's Hideaway Wines. You can purchase wines, you can sign up for their wine club, uh, and they were very kind to send us some of these. So thank you very much. Mine's Listen. called S&M. <laughs> I have Listen, the, uh... this, is, uh, this is quarantine. And this is not the first like wine delivered to your door subscription service I use, but it is fantastic. And uh, it's the perfect time to do that. The wine I'm drinking is Flocking Fabulous. I love that. And Which it's I a love. 2019 Santa Barbara County Rosé. So it's really love good. Love it. So dang hot today. I was like, I need a refreshing rosé. You know, it was. Mine is private office, which is fitting because I drink a lot of wine in my private office, which is my home. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Um, awesome. So uh, make sure you check them out if you haven't already. And cheers. It cheers, so cool. It's also so cool that like, since we've been doing the show, we've always been drinking wine since yep. we started Alpha Book Club and, and now Nerdist Book Club. Yeah. And it's cool that- years. For years, and it's cool that for the first time ever, somebody sent us wine. So that's I know. awesome. <laughs> How like, many bottles did legit. I have to drink? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no. Well, also they sent us. You know, we're we're covering. We'll get into it, but we're covering a very exciting book over the next six weeks. And so they sent us um, some awesome wines that we'll share with you. But I was like, this is gonna be a test of willpower. <laughs> I yeah. thankfully One I have roommates. An episode. <laughs> yeah, I have roommates, and I was like, "Look, as soon as I crack this bad boy open, please come." And they've already gotten some glasses, yeah. and we're going to yeah. be able to finish this in, tonight, no problem. But yeah, if I was um, if I was living by myself, I would be drunk as a skunk right now. <laughs> well, I live by myself. I live yeah. with hello. You. But yeah, yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah. I know. So. We need. Well, it's almost like a you know. A little... mm -mm. I don't know who that is. Um, I don't know if you can hear it on air either. So ghosts, there are ghosts. Um, but everyone, thank you so much. You are just as much a part of this book club as we are. Um, if, whether you're joining us on Nerdist YouTube channel, Geek and Sundry's YouTube channel, Geek and Sundry Twitch, if you're watching this later because you couldn't join us live, we really appreciate you coming and hanging out with us. Um, we have reestablished our Goodreads account for Nerdist Book Club. So if you have suggestions for us or if you can't, Again, tune in live in the chat. We'll try to ch shout everyone out when we can. Because we've been um, doing book clubs since 2016. With which is insane. Club. Yeah. Really? Yeah. yeah. We started at the hey. end of October 2016. It was October 2016. Yeah. Uh -huh. so, somebody in the chat said, uh, Spacey360 said, 1 a.m. in the UK, beer o'clock. Hey, that's awesome. Hi that's in the yeah, UK. Man. That's Love amazing. That yeah, wow, Bible Geek, Geek Girls having a bottle of spice wine left over from Christmas. Break it oh, out. That's mm -hmm. perfect. Very nice. I love that. Hi, yeah, Bible Geek us, Girl. Let up. We love you. Let us know what you're drinking, even if it's a mocktail. It's a, a sparkling water. There's no judgment here. Um. Oh, my neighbors are, for the first time ever, making sounds. Um. Ooh. So thank you all for joining us, though, and and we do try to continue the conversation on Twitter, on Goodreads. Um, Geek Bomb after the show for the official after show, which we'll tell you all about. Um, but let's get into it. We've got a beast of a book. We are finally cracking into Frank Herbert's Dune. We got these beautiful new hardcover, hardcover, hardcover editions. 
um, courtesy of the folks over at Penguin, so we can read in style. They're gorgeous. Yeah. But this they, is, like, that's a doorstopper. It's a really, really big book. And I think that over the course of the, what, three and a half years that we've been doing book club, we've always put suggestions in. What are the top books that you have to kind of mm -hmm. pick apart? And we did the ones that were super, super fun and exciting, like Wrinkle in Time. And we did ones that were a little bit hard to digest, like 1984. But all the books that we've been covering are what we think to be staples in a book club community, like things that you kind of have to get at. And Dune has been such a pivotal book in sci-fi that has influenced so much of pop culture. And yeah, it was a little bit sort of like uh, with trepidation to go into it because we only usually have a month per book. But we thought, well, let's get it stuck into June and let's do it properly by allowing six full weeks to break this up so that we can really do it justice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm, and we're all uh, noobs to reading Dune and we will definitely, we're reading it in different ways as well. And we yeah. will definitely be going through, you know, pronunciations and the glossary and all sorts of uh fun things for people who might also have felt either intimidated or just haven't had the time to sit down and you know crack this one open but much as Hector has said it's corn time is the time to corn and it is the time to drink wine and um, read books that you've never read before so yeah. the novel itself is divided into three sub books um, and so we're covering, as Maud said, the whole thing over the next six weeks. And this week we read the first half of book one. So um, Hector, do you want to tell us a little bit about the author, Frank Herbert? Yes, of course. You know what? I'm just going to read it from the inside flap of this really nice yep, hardcover book that I have. Yep. Frank Herbert is the best-selling author of the Dune Saga. He was born in Tacoma, Washington, and educated at the University of Washington, Seattle. He worked a wide variety of jobs, including TV cameraman, radio commentator, oyster diver, jungle survival instructor, lay analyst, creative writing teacher, reporter, and editor of several West Coast newspapers before becoming a full-time writer. In 1952, Herbert began publishing science fiction with looking for something in startling stories, but his emergence as a writer of major stature did not occur until 1965 with the publication of Dune. This was followed by Dune Messiah, Children of Dune, God Emperor of Dune, Heretics of Dune, and Chapter House Dune to complete the best-selling saga. Herbert is also the author of some 20 other books, including The White Plague, The Dosati Experiment, and Destination Boy. He died in 1986. You know what else I love about this edition of the book? Is there's a fantastic, fantastic introduction. Uh, introduction or forward? Introduction from the author's son, which I think is really, really fantastic. Introduction. Yeah. It's an introduction by Brian Herbert. And I read that after I had already started reading the, the, the book a little bit. And to read the introduction provided me with so much great context of like, okay, this is what this story meant to this author. This is who this, this is what the author meant to this man, Brian, like his father and what it was like living with him and, and the rebellious times that they had together. And it provided me a ton, a ton, a ton of context that I really, really, really appreciated. Um, and I feel like helped me understand uh, uh, the, the author Herbert a little bit more as like a person you know, because again, he 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 wrote this insanely, like I can't even describe how forward thinking it is in terms of science fiction, and yet it said Tacoma, Washington. You know, he's just like a regular guy, and I, and I love hearing that backstory of an author like this that will go and write this incredible, you know, very otherworldly but still uh, grounded in human themes, mm -hmm. impactful and and influential science fiction to just know that he was also a writer who was struggling and nobody wanted to publish it and it was too long to publish. And that whole journey was really great. And also, you know, Brian's journey in, in, in terms of, you know, where he is now in his life and, and kind of how it led also to that. He tweeted us. Um, he tweeted about our book club. Yeah. I know, yeah. which is so cool. And so um, cool. such a like honor that, um, yeah, that he, he is watching and participating. So thank you. And also, there's also um, just an interesting, uh, tidbits about how he sort of Frank Herbert got the idea from Dune uh, after researching Sand Dunes for a magazine article that was ultimately scrapped. And anyone who um, I know that a lot of, you know, all of y'all um, and a lot of the Nerdist team understand the like deep dives that when you're mm -hmm. reading something, you're writing, you're researching, and all of a sudden you're like, it's 1 a.m. and I'm just down the rabbit hole on this one thing and maybe it's not even gonna go anywhere. And 
that's fine. I just like the learning. I like digging into it, which I think is really awesome. And uh, Dune was originally published in eight installments in the magazine Analog in 1963 oh. and 65, which reminds me of my fave uh, Ray Bradbury, the Martian. Con- a lot of his short stories yep. that later became books became part of the collection. So those have got to be um, collector's editions at this yeah. point, right? Yeah, and uh, oh, a hundred percent. Yeah, and and you know, s- similar era and um, very different writing styles, obviously, but these super ahead of their time. Um, and what I think all great sci-fi does, which is like you said, Hector, bringing these human themes in, and mm-hmm. and the father-son element, especially in this first part of the book, is such a huge element of kind of getting to know. Mm-hmm. Paul and the Duke. So um, yeah, it's just, I'm really digging it so far. We're definitely going to dive into it, but um, let's see. A lot of folks are also reading along and excited about it. Yeah. What we actually asked in the chat um, was, are you reading this book for the first time? And there are a lot more yeses than nos. It is mm-hmm. all of our first time, um, but there is a general, a gen, gen, general consensus happening in the chat and that is that um some people really attempted to read it um they ha- kind of got into it they were like oh this is a little bit tough i'm gonna put it down and kind of didn't get to go back to it um but if you'd asked me 10 years ago that there's like infinite ways to read a book i'd be like what nah man you just read it you turn the page read it. but now yeah. it's like audible um reading a book watching the movie first uh there's so many different ways and i really can't wait to get stuck into the three different ways that you and i um all of us are reading this particular book uh, mm-hmm. i wouldn't mind asking the chat as well yeah uh, i love hearing who's reading it for the first time and who is not there are some diehard fans in there who are very particular about this book uh and i love that as well because i want you to teach me um yes, but I also want to ask, did you listen to this or did you read this book was it an audible or was it reading because someone said that they initially read the book, but this time listened to it on Audible and were grateful to do so because for the first time they're understanding the pronunciations for a lot of these complicated words. Mm-hmm. Yes, which Hermione, is... Hermione, what was it? Hermione? Hermione. 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 I love that you all remember that better than I do. That's yep. so cool. That's fun. Yep. Uh-huh. That's no, I thought that, no, no, no. I did the same thing. That's <laughs> oh, why. Okay. I did the exact same thing and the movie came out was like, like what? Yeah. yeah. I've never heard this. I mean, well, not I heard from Hermione. I was like, <laughs> what? Um, but, yeah. And I also, I mean, we've also talked about reading, um, you know, visually versus through audio. Um, we all, I think, when we were younger, had words that mine that I always talk about is uh, preface. I thought it was preface. Makes sense. It's pre the face of the book. I don't know. But, um, yeah, so we're we're dive, let's dive right in. Um, as everyone is saying in the chat, um, let us know how you are reading this. All of it counts, even if you. And we used to get a little persnickety with Hector when he would watch the movie before. Um, I'm learning more. But I'm honestly, the worst thing. if it gets you into it, it doesn't matter. Let me just get uh, this out of the way. Let me just get this out of the way. Fine. Never read Dune. Yep. Uh, before I started reading this book for this show, I, with my roommates, watched the 1984 Dune movie, and it's insane. And it was—you've never seen it before. I'd never seen the movie either. I'd only, mm. you know, what do you know from Dune? From pop culture? From from whenever anybody mentions Dune, people it's go. It's a book you have to read. But yeah, it's people say that, and then and then they go like, "Fear is the mind killer." I'm like, "Okay, man, I don't know what that's from. That's cool." You know, if you walk without r- r- rhythm, you won't attract the worm. All right, Fat Boy Slim. I don't know what that is. <laughs> so, getting to watch the movie, <laughs> getting to watch the movie, and like getting that context was really helpful. The movie itself is really entertaining. There's some great stuff in it. There's some bonkers '80s movie stuff in it. It's a David Lynch film, but it's also like the of the few David Lynch films I've seen so far, it's kind of the most grounded of a of a movie, uh, which is saying I, a lot. Sort of get what you're saying, there. right? Like it's yeah. like Mulholland Drive that's set in Los Angeles is kind of more esoteric. There's more of a than, framework. That's set right. Up that is it's clear, a, a straightforward it, narrative. Yeah. So I was telling Maude before we started rolling, uh, we before we went live that like I'm really glad I did that because it gave me enough of a framework and an understanding of what the bigger picture is, the larger story, the some of the visuals. And some of the concepts and especially the names and the pronunciations that when I started reading, I went, okay, even if I can't always 
completely 100% keep up with every word that's being said in terms of, you know, what they're, what the characters are saying to one another, what the terminology is. I've started to, to, I've even started to be able to recast some of the roles with like the new actors in the new movie that's coming out. Legit. I'm like, I can hear Oscar Isaac as Paul's oh my father. God. Yeah. I and can we'll, hear, right. Rebecca Ferguson as Jessica. Like I, I can start to do I, that. I so really it's am digging it. And I, I actually, for this section, I, I know a lot of the main characters in casting and I'm so excited to see that movie. I love, and I'm sorry again to pronounce his name because I don't speak French, but Denis Villeneuve. Denis Villeneuve. <laughs> I just really like saying his name. Um, but <laughs> I love his movies and I love, and we'll obviously get deep, deep into the themes, but I think that uh, between Arrival and Blade Runner, um, not just the aesthetic you know, choices that he makes, but also the uh, character choices that he makes and the stories that he tells anything that you know in a 2020 context where I'm like hmm, about you know gender different different things that we'll get into I'm like you know what I, I do really trust um, that this project is going to kind of take this framework and bring it into where we are now and even just from the casting and a lot of the uh, shout out to Dan Casey, Matt Karen, Lindsay Romain, Amy Ratcliffe, who are the Dune experts, uh, Steven Zerwinski, I that I'm like, hey, so this thing and this, and they'll tell me everything, but they're super excited because they know the core of the book and what that might look like, you know, in this version. So very excited. Also definitely thinking about Oscar Isaac a lot. I'm not, general, at all, but also while reading this, I have not let any of the casting, I have not touched any of that stuff because you know me, Hector, mm -hmm. he and I are completely different. He will consume all <laughs> this before going into a book. You're I like so cute. Lee, will you, will you just mark this timestamp right now? Thank you for doing that. That was the cutest thing I've ever seen. I, I, yeah, I have to go into the blank canvas because I have to flesh it out on my own and I have to establish it. And if that means reading through twice, then so okay. be it but I need to be able to have my version and then compare it to the next version and be like, yes, that's where I was at or mm, interesting choice. And mm. I'm in the middle where I know Hector, you're on the film, you know, film helps you frame the reading for me because I'm not, I'm just, I'm thinking about the characters. So for some of them, I'm like, oh, this, this care, I know this actor could portray this character in this way. I'm still not even really like, picturing them saying it, but it does the Oscar Isaac one and as, as the Duke and uh, Lady Jessica with mm -hmm. um, my love, whose name, Rebecca Ferguson, yeah. um, who's amazing. I just, also, I just last night we rewatched Mission Impossible Rogue Nation where Rebecca Ferguson shows yeah, it's up. It's my favorite one okay. because she's so, yeah. in it with the yellow dress. Oh, amazing. So she, yeah. That's the one that Tom Cruise holds his breath for over six minutes. Yes. And he actually did. Yeah. He, and in he's training, not going yeah. to space. Mm -hmm. so, cool. um, okay, we have a lot. This book is really done. So I'm going to sort of give a non-spoilery explanation of the universe for, uh, for people who are new to it like we are. And then we'll kind of get into the characters and what happened in this section. Um, again, in the chats, Nerdist YouTube, Geek and Sundry YouTube, Geek and Sundry Twitch, Twitter, wherever you are um, in the future watching this later, uh, send us your questions, thoughts. If I butcher pronunciations, I'm very sorry. Um, I'm trying my best, but okay. And so I here's the thing. the phonetic soundings in, as a comment as well, so we can all get better. Yes, please. And if I, if I, I'll probably look to Maude and Hector um, and our lovely producers if I'm doing it wrong when I read it, but um, yes. So let's see, Dune play, Dune. Hmm, starting <laughs> Good stuff. Dune takes place thousands of years in the future in a human empire that stretches across the stars. It's a semi-feudal society where power is divided among three pillars, the Padishah Emperor, the Great Houses, and the Spacing Guild. Interstellar space travel is monopolized by the Spacing Guild, and space travel requires the spice melange, a mind-altering substance that can only be mined on one planet, Arrakis, known as Dune. That's the name of the book. Whomever controls Dune controls the richest commodity ever known to man. Long ago, there was a religious uprising against artificial intelligence known as the Butlerian Jihad. Since then, there are no computers as we know them or machines that mimic the minds of humans. Little Battlestar influence there. 
Uh, the Dune series is full of themes like ecological conservation, political intrigue, the survival of the human race, religion, colonialism, and much, much, much more. So now we're getting into the characters. So we're I mean, going to get a lot. Right what? That is already a lot. That's already a lot. Mm -hmm. I, honestly, for me, that sort of, I think because so many other sci-fi stories have clearly been influenced by this. I was like, okay, got it. Like there's a weird, there's a spice trade. There's all, of, it, it's, it's so political and yeah. I do the, the nuance of it might not make sense to me completely yet of how everything is impacting each other, but it's like, this is the hub. This is the place. I mean, modern version oil, very, mm -hmm. you know, similar um, and taking a, uh, a place and it's people and displacing them in order to mine this place for resources and the sort of rich houses that are fighting over it. Um, and, and this prophecy of, you know, a chosen one, that, that stuff, even if I'm like, okay, I don't understand quite how the space guild fits in as much yet. And I'm doing research, but the general framework, I think that's what stands out to me. I'd really love to do, uh, just, um discuss this concept because I have always sort of if there was a choice between sci-fi and fantasy gone to fantasy because right. fantasy is in pre usually like pre-time so there's no mm. technology there's no forms of mm. like immediate transport where you can cover vast amounts of land and so it's all really quite contained huh? maybe you can travel you know hell weird yeah. wheel of time or magic travel like yeah. it's more magic based so it's it's within a fantastical rule set versus technology especially now we're like well who would have predicted everything that we live that's in? the thing so when it's like uh, like this whole galactic scope where it's like not just a little region but it's an entire planet um and every planet can have its own unique ecosystem in itself like that to me kind of can get a little overwhelming because but it also, the luxury of that is it provides endless possibilities of what you can do. So mm -hmm. I, I guess I want to ask other readers here, um, are you also finding that with like the, the distinction between fantasy and sci-fi or are there a lot of different fantasies that are huge scoped or is there a lot of sci-fi that's more contained? And do you think Dune has done um, enough in the sci-fi genre to kind of keep you anchored in to the mm -hmm. story and where it's going like that it sets up its own rules and follows those and doesn't it yeah when i was when i was a kid i think i gravitated more towards science fiction and ultimately more towards superhero stuff and comic books and superhero comics because what? they were even to me one step yeah isn't that weird they were one step further where it's like not only is this not fantasy where in my kid brain i thought anything could happen mm -hmm. and there are truly no stakes because it's like if you watch the movie spirited away things just happen in that, you know, and, and I didn't understand like, hey, they never explained in the story that something like that could just happen and now magically it happens and that's the solution for whatever the problem is. And I, that was almost overwhelming to me. And so I gravitated more towards science fiction with its like grounded Fact. rules yeah. and then superhero stories, which are just supposed to be mostly uh, our American or modern, you know, present, but with one character that's like, I've got supernatural powers, but they still exist in this city. It's as I got older, a recognizable world. It's almost right. like contempt I mean, contemporary fantasy yeah, is kind of similar. Yeah. The Dresden Files, exactly. which we've talked about, exactly. Harry and Potter, I, where it, it has that mm -hmm. framework, and someone is either the one Just magical the person. That every day was the same and yep. normal. Yeah, yeah. yeah. but and, one thing, and that, or you're the the new character, like a Harry Potter. Mm -hmm. Insert every other, you know. Character. So. Yeah, as yeah. I got older, I realized that like, well, they really are all the same because they're constructed stories. And if they're well constructed, you yeah. will still feel what Maude is describing, where it's like you don't feel overwhelmed. Even if you have endless possibilities, a science fiction story like something like Star Trek will tell you, OK, there is people in the future, hundreds of years from now, they can travel faster than the speed of light, but only to warp nine point, you know, oh, or whatever. And there's only this number of planets and it's only in our galaxy and it's fine. The same with Lord of the Rings, Harry Potter, you right. know, Superman, Bat everything we're describing. So for me reading this story, I felt like I, because I watched the film and the film basically opens with its own version of the Star Wars scroll the crawl that sets everything up helpful for me but the book does not do that the book is just like here you go first chapter paul 
you're already in the middle of a thing. And I liked that in this story. I liked that it does, to me, it doesn't throw you in the deep end per se, but it, it does open with like, he's pretending to be asleep. They're having a conversation about him. And you're like, who, what's going on? Thank you. This right? first chunk of the book, I, yeah. I'm so torn between there was so much exposition and there was not much at all because mm -hmm. they would sometimes spend a lot of time going, all right, this is what it is and this is why it is. But then other things, they would just say a word you'd never heard before yeah. and expect you to know it. Um, and it was quite you know interesting. It reminded me of, just because I know you, we read this on Alpha Book Club um, and I know that uh, Maud, you are a fellow fan, but it reminded me, a, not stylistically or anything like that, but throwing you into the world his dark materials mm -hmm. where yeah, okay. you that first chapter um and it's another one similarly where i think if you um our lovely producer steven was saying that he's reading this again and it it made it it was it came back much easier and it was easier once you had read it once to sort of understand that and i think that's what i felt like when we did his dark materials where i was like well this is how mm -hmm. like i couldn't even fathom being confused because i'd known where it right went. but in and that that's, story that's say, good rule build that's good yes. universe and, building and right having in a that, set of rules yeah in that story what's the main character's name what's the girl's name lyra lyra knows a bunch of stuff and Lyman. Pants alignment, okay. but Lyra. That's knows quite funny because I have a DD character called Lyra, and then you have a cat called Pants alignment. So <laughs> I have Same to thing, really. Cat, um, I have to address a comment because it's completely on this notion, and it also talks about a book that we've previously done for um, Alpha Book Club. And it's interesting that they share the same audible uh, narrator. But the Tamaranian yes. said, Oh, hi, good to, good to hear from you again. Ozzy said, you. Did anyone else find the explaininess? of the exposition like Anne Rice and what Anne Rice used to do with her exposition. That, that's oh, funny. well, but we haven't done the Vampire List out, which I feel like, and mm. The Subtle Knife, both of which I want to do. Those are second. Um, but I would, I would say that once you get further into Anne Rice's books, a lot of that world building changes. I think this actually does a better a much better job of throwing you a little bit into it and it's intimidating and I remember trying to read it when a couple of times before I'm being like nope I can't but to the to the point of how you're reading it um I've been doing the audiobook and then also marking parts in this beautiful book and looking at the glossary and that has helped me a lot to you're marking like, the book? No, no, no. With little, no, 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 oh. no. With like tabs. I'm so sorry. That's fine too. It's I mean, book. I do you that. Can, can, I do that yeah. with like can not a you very want. beautiful deluxe. But, but book. this thing is gorgeous. No, no, no. I would never. <laughs> I would never harm this beautiful baby. Um, but no, with my like old books that I love mm. and have read a million times. Oh, there's. You don't want to see it. It's. I want to read a comment from the chat. Yeah. Julie Manning says we got to soak in Kalistan or Caladan. Mm -hmm. Caladan to get oh. the full contrast of their life there yes. and what their life would be like on Arrakis. And again, mm -hmm. me having that movie context to read those first few chapters, I'm like, yes, they're constantly mentioning how wet it is and how much rain there is and the characters reflecting on that. And then when you get to, and that's the one probably like issue that I took with this first uh, few chapters. Like Nino in the prequels. What's that? Yeah. yeah, exactly. Exactly. Just constantly raining. But that was my one thing is that in the movie, they do a bit more of showing you stuff of like, okay, here's how space, like, here's how they're going to space travel and actually show you moving from planet to planet. But in this, it just goes from one chapter to the next and you're already on Dune, the desert But planet. I think you, I, I mean, I haven't, it took a lot actually for me not to read ahead, which is crazy because when I tried to read this before, I was like, I can't, I can't do it. But I really wanted to keep going. Um, I'm sort of a, this is a good segue to get into everyone we've met so far, but I, growing up, I mean, I always, it's much like the, oh, I have to like some books, but I've always gravitated, gravitated towards horror and like thriller with science fiction or fantasy elements, but it's always been something darker, something that's very character driven and ta takes whatever sort of those human moments are, whatever genre it is and tells the story through that lens. So I just saw, we just go to nerdist.com and check it out, but uh, Christopher Pike, who wrote a lot of my favorite, favorite like horror sci-fi books that if you did Goosebumps and then like Fear Street, Christopher Pike was sort of 
the bridge between that and like Stephen King or something like that. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, Mike Flanagan, who did Haunting of Hill House and many other amazing Dr. Sleep, um, Gerald's Game is doing a Christopher Pike show that will incorporate a lot of different books and stuff. So if you are also a Christopher Pike stan, I'm excited for you and me. But um, I, I think the characters this time, once I got past the first, you know, just introduction of characters and what was happening. And I was like, the, you know, Benny and Jess are out and all of these things. I was like, man, I don't understand. But listening to it now, it felt like a play that I was sort of mm. an immersive play, uh, yeah. like Sleep No More, when we would go be able to go to the outside world. For those that are not listening to the book and just reading, it is set out like a bit of a um, a, a production, a play. So there's um, Jessica is a female voice actor. You know, you have yeah. different roles. That's great. The narrator I love is it. the same narrator from Interview with a Vampire. And I noticed that big time. And it actually, like, my subconscious was bringing me back there because oh, interesting. of voice. Yeah. Mm. Um, but you have a different actor for Paul. You have a different um, actor for Leto. Like, you know, you here i love the the, uh, down. that helped that was super super helpful for me that helps me a lot as well and it just it feels more i get a little lost both in fantasy and sci-fi actually when there are there's this other language which i find so impressive and so interesting um but when it feels very abstract to me and because i'm not sort of watching it happen it can blend together. And so having these di disparate voices and sort of hearing, you know, Paul's sort of like, how dare you, you know, speak to me that way. And which, which grandma is like, uh, uh, no, don't talk to me that way. I love, I mean, I'm very excited about all the witchiness, obviously, but mm. let's, let's go through all of our characters so far. Um, we're not gonna do any spoilers for later in the book. I have seen the movie. I know Hector, you've seen the original movie, but- um, I'm going in completely like a- I don't remember like the actual plot of the movie really at all. I watched it. Um, it's insane. It's crazy. In my early, I mean, <laughs> I know that it's insane. I watched it in my early twenties. So you can make Man. whatever assumptions from that. When Patrick Stewart like showed up, I was job. like, yes, young Patrick Stewart. Let's what? do this. Not, I'm oh, telling you, this movie it. is fun. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, and, uh, but yeah, we're, we're avoiding spoilers for many of us. It sounds like in the chat are joining us, which is really honestly exciting because I think there are certain franchises of any medium where you feel intimidated or like, I'm very afraid to make a pronunciation mistake um, right now as I get going. But even though I'm listening to it, it's hard for me to retain it. But I'm really glad that we have this. We're fostering this community where we, whether you're excited for, you know, Oscar Isaac, Timothy, Zendaya, all of the folks in the new movie, it's been on your list all of these different things. Like, I'm really excited we're doing this together. There's no so. better time than now, especially in quarantine. Um, while we're getting into the character discussions, because we will go over all the characters, just as a refresher, explore who they are and the relationships they have with each other. But the Tamaranian in the YouTube comments has said, who has the best character name? So keep that in mind and make your mm. comments as well. Mm -hmm. She said, um, Idaho. Duncan Idaho. Um, I love Duncan Idaho. She goes, it sounds like a hipster cowboy. <laughs> yeah, I'm uh, just on like name alone and sort of what we know about the characters so far. I was like, mm, hot. That's a hot name, hot character. Duncan Idaho, yeah. Um, I also really love that there are all of these incredible names and Maude, you were saying before we went on that it's almost like another language. Yeah. Um, but then a lot of the main characters are like, Paul and Jessica. Yeah, Paul. Jessica's the name Paul. Of my oh, best Paul. friends, which makes me laugh a lot. Um, actually, Paul, who is a longtime uh, viewer of uh, Alpha Book Club, was so excited that finally this massive property is recognizing Pauls. Yep. It's not. It's not necessarily a name you associate with like the a science sci fi hero. Yeah, it's. I do really enjoy that. So that's what's so endearing about it, though. Yeah, I really no, I really I. I'm really digging it so far. So let's go through everyone we've met. We've met a lot of people so far, even just in this one section. So we have Paul Atreides. He's the 15 year old heir to the great Atreides house. Am I saying it right? I don't really Atreides? Know. Okay, great. Yeah. 
um, based on the water planet of Caladan, uh, could be the Hatterach. So also, if you're listening to it or basing off of the movie or like canon from pre audiobooks, I think there are some changes there. But in the audiobook, I believe it's Kwisatz, Kwisatz Hatterach. Mm -hmm. Actually, so, really quickly, the, the books are all the Muad'Dib and everyone's saying that they, and we need to recognize that my name's actually getting mentioned throughout all of this. It's the Muad'Dib. Cool. Muad'Dib. <laughs> <laughs> um i accidentally didn't realize that my tattoo of my cat when you look at it this way looks like he's stabbing so <laughs> yeah totally <Wow. laughs> um but what's really important about uh paul is that he's said to be the chosen one and exactly. the chosen one is definitely a trope in a lot of fantasy novels um, and a shout out to a commenter who earlier said that dune wasn't necessarily a sci-fi but a space fantasy book and i think mm -hmm. that Chosen One notion. It's definitely like that, even though Luke Skywalker was te technically like the Chosen One, but he was kind of the only Jedi left to do the job. Um, but he's sought after by the Bene Gesserit order. Um, a little fun fact, the way that I have been remembering the Bene Gesserit is the B -b -b Bene Gesserit. I was doing that too! Are you kidding me, <laughs> Danny? Yeah. We're going to get sued. But, uh, you guys got to just watch the no, movie. <laughs> no, it's that's not. A Here's the thing, Hector. I respect that that's how you like to do it. I, I don't want to speak for Maude. I love, when I was younger and I would read books and thought I was like, I'm so smart. I'm going to read above my grade level kind of. I mean, I kept that information to myself. I wasn't like a brat about it just mm. in my head. But I had a little pocket dictionary and I would look up words that I didn't know. And I had a little notebook that I'd write down the definitions in. Aww. And yeah, yeah. it's like, part of like Nerdist, like as a job is, is and Geek Bomb and DC Daily, like all of those elements of tracking down the original source material or the frame from the comics. I know we've had, we have writers and I'm sure you all work with folks like this too who can watch an episode of the flash and be like oh that's a direct reference to the, this panel and this yeah, thing and yeah like, yeah yeah oh, that's so cool i have to go look at that and yeah. so having having a you know the resources to research that as i'm reading i actually find that really fun much like you like and want to watch it first you know what i mean i get that yeah um it is worth mentioning that Paul Atreides will be played by Timothy Chalamet. But what I would like to talk to you about is the fact that Paul is super astute and that is a part of his gift where he's mm. so observant. There is an like an empathic kind of thing going on where they can detect feelings, they can detect um, truth. They know when someone's lying, which is fantastic. I really love that because, and Hector, I kind of wanted to pick your brain about that because this is essentially like a superpower. Mm -hmm. um, well, and the, the men, Mentats as well, and the fact mm -hmm. that he's been secretly being trained at this point. And I love that he's sort of a precocious kid who wasn't around other children growing up, but has all of these mentors, these adult yeah. mentors who sort of influence what he's like as a person. And it reminds me of a very silly tweet I saw recently or whatever, some sort of meme that was like, Remember when you were a kid and everyone was like, oh my God, you're such an old soul. Or you're so precocious. And it was like, yeah, I, it, what it really meant was, how have you lost so much serotonin or not had so much? Like, when no, you're, I've actually had a debate about this. Really it's thought, old he's a really soul. thoughtful weird, like, kid who's in his own head, who yep. is, is very adult for his age. And I immediately was like, I gravitated towards that sort of quiet, not even confidence, but quiet, awareness of yourself yeah or what you think is awareness at 15 you know our, our buddy that matt karen guy says he's a homeschooled kid homeschooled by a bene gesserit and a and a mentat that's yep. and, I'm, and i think that's a great comparison so, yeah. i want to tell you guys who i've been picturing paul atreides as and it might be because i'm watching a lot of community at the moment but paul is a bed <laughs> oh i love that <laughs> where it's just sort of like, just absorbing. It's yeah. still it's silent, but it's just taking I rewatched all of Community when it hit Netflix too. It's, yeah. Yeah. I love that's, that. That's where it's at. Um, okay. We have more to get through. So I'm going to power through the characters and then we'll get through what's happened because 
a lot actually does happen. So Lady Jessica, already my favorite character, surprise, Paul's mother and concubine to Duke Atreides. She's a member of the Benny Gesserit Order, uh, played by Rebecca Ferguson, who is so cool. She's so hot, so scary, so intense, so like can be vulnerable. Like I'm, I, I cannot wait to see her play this character. I'm, I love this. There's so much epic with witches, yeah. and it's definitely a, a very strange system that she's in that we're still figuring out of these powerful witchy women sort of you know manipulating politics behind the scenes through who their you know lovers are who their husbands are what kind of children they can have and the fact that she was supposed to only have daughters and had Paul and that mm -hmm. he is such an empath and that having the you know especially for 1965 uh, the masculine and the feminine and, and the power in both of those things really there's obviously a lot of stuff as we go on that we can talk about yeah. with gender but for 1965 to be looking at the power of the femininity and the masculine together I think it that immediately when we went through with um, the reverend mother whose name yeah. we'll get into next um, <laughs> guys that, on him um, but before we, Gaius Helen Mohim, but before we go into that, what I'm really excited about, like Jessica for me had so many layers. Initially it was like, you heard concubine yeah. and I would go, cool. There's a leadership. She's there. But then more and more, it's like, oh, she's a Bene Gesserit. Like she's actually super like intellectual and understanding and emp empathetic. And then you also realize that she's a really determined mother and mm -hmm. that she cherishes um, Paul and that, you know, they have a really significant bond. And then you realize that she doesn't want to force the Duke to do anything. Yes, I love that too. Love so her. powerful. That yeah. notion stood out to me so much. And I feel like that I've related to that as well. Mm -hmm. where like, I could ask them to do that, but then they feel like they have to do it. Not that they want to do Listen, it. Listen, how relatable that. is it? How relatable is it to be with Oscar Isaac and he doesn't want to marry you and you're like, that's fine i'm here i'm in it yeah i will I'll take, take you however i can get you 100 <laughs> percent. i'm here i'm no, ready but, but jessica is a is a fantastic character for everything you guys are saying and i read a little bit of the book and then went back and like i said i read the introduction of this edition where brian is describing that his father frank loved his wife and that so much of, of his love for his wife even her having like real life uh um supernatural you know foresight mm -hmm found its way into the book. And, and then going back and finishing the rest of this section, I went, yeah, Frank, the writer, Frank Herbert loves the character, Jessica, yeah. in the yeah. way and that he writes her. the She's power cool. of the mother and yeah. totally. the witch. And, love and lover. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I'm so excited there, to see a, Rebecca Ferguson take on this yeah. role. My, I guess we'll get to it at the end, but I kind of do want to talk about like your favorite scene. Um, and mm. it's, yeah the one that I've kind of spoken about where she was challenged um, by, I'm going to say Yui because that's how it's pronounced in the books. But yeah, Dr. Yui was talking, well, I was like, Yui! Uh, was, <laughs> you know, going, he was trying, obviously keeping a secret that he was a traitor. And so he was using bells and whistles to kind of like distract and detract from that. And one of the questions was, oh yeah, why haven't you gotten the Duke to marry you? So that part was like my favorite part of the book. But also yeah. you discover with Jessica that she sees the best in people. Mm -hmm. It is yeah. so obvious that he's trying to deflect truth and he's saying truths, but he's keeping this- well, Because they're both good at reading. They have the- This dance, man. Like it's I... such a great scene to read. And I, I listened to it twice and I loved it even better, than, obviously the second time. The book is better the second time. Um, and I'm, yeah, reading twice, even though Hector thinks it's a waste of time. Um, but I, yeah, I just <laughs> love her as a character, but that particular part reminded me that it doesn't really matter what you're feeling or what you're trying to hide. Everyone's got so much on their own mind and they're right. in their own head about their own shit that they're just not noticing what's in front of them. That has literally saved my life. Uh, that, that sort of mentality of for as much as you are worrying about everyone else and what they think of you, they are doing the same thing for themselves. Even if they're confident, even whatever, everyone is too you know worried about that. But I also love 
And, and as we get into the book and research more and, and learn more about these characters, I love that the Mentats and the, um, uh, just, or got the, um, the- And the Jesuit? The Jesuit, yes, the Benny Jesuit, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, so many names. Um, okay. That they're both truth sayers, sort of, mm -hmm. and-, and I call them people. BS detectives. <laughs> And, 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 and sort of the kind of person, which I know we've all talked about as well, that when you are an empath or a very empathetic person and you can pick up on the, the just vibe in the room, not to be super Californian, but just the general um, energy of what's going on around you. And I love that we have these sort of two different types of strong characters in their systems that they were trained in mm -hmm. and that's the that's the power is is sensing what's going on with other people and figuring that out so next that get into like yeah reverend mother who reminds me uh you know we've talked about some of the game of thrones parallels and these oh, yeah I, that's Elena tyrell for me in my head where she's like i'm i don't care what you think Elena don't tyrell. ask me yeah um so Reverend Mother uh, Gaius Helen Mohain, a high-ranking member of the Beni Gesserit Order, who tests Paul with the Gom Jabbar. Sweet thing. Um, I'm getting nods from our Dean expert friends. Gom Jabbar. <laughs> I get it right. Um, loved her just briefly. I was like, this sassy old bird mm -hmm. does not care that you're a, a little dupling. She does not give a shit. This character was, in the 1984 movie, almost scarier and more witch-like and more antagonistic. Mm. And then when I, after seeing the movie, I'm like, okay, that's who that character is. Then I read this section and she felt more um, empathetic and kind of like uh, um, sympathetic and, and relatable and not necessarily she motherly. She became or, like, instead of an antagonist, which is right. like, my God, if you look back in that era of um, movies, the anyone right. who was like older that had information was this, wicked witch you yeah. know oh my goodness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um no but it's, it's basically yeah man. if it's a man he's sort of a, a guiding force and if it's right. a woman it's like oh she's so old she must be you're gonna evil. put hansel and gretel into an oven and bake them yeah exactly. right right, right. Uh, but i love the fact that it quite quite quickly they did trust no, <laughs> quickly established um uh mother guys uh mohaim as a mentor and it was like no no i'm calling her jessica because we have a pre-established relationship and i've known mm -hmm. her for a lot longer i've been doing this for so long do not waste my time sit down shut up and put your hand in this box <laughs> listen yeah and and also yeah she reminds me of the teacher um that you have who is super stern and probably gives you a lot of shit but it's because she knows that you can handle it mm -hmm. And that could be any gender, but it, it reminded me of, a, she reminded me of a specific teacher I had where I was like, God, why does she hate me so much? And then yep. in, you know, hind, hindsight, it's 2020. Um, but realizing that she was challenging me because she thought that I could handle it, you know what I mean? But yep. I, lo I love her. I think she's dope. I love a matriarchy. Mm -hmm. yep. Even if it's behind the scenes. An amazing quote that Rachel Beaver has put in the chat um, says that her favorite quote from the Reverend Mother is, a world is supported by four things, the learning of the wise, the justice of the great, the prayers of the righteous, and the valor of the brave. That's nearly the Triforce. What hand? That's and I love that <laughs> then right after that, as we're getting to know the Duke and Paul's relationship with his father, that the, the sort of part that holds that all together is a ruler who knows how to rule and and it gets into how they rule what time they're living in what people they're you know working with sometimes i think a, a kinder ruler makes sense for a certain time i mean obviously i'm always pro kindness not terrible rulers but you know what i mean this idea that you have to rise to a certain occasion to a moment so um then we have speaking of the duke leto atreides who has to lead the family from the planet caladan to their new fiefdom of arrakis it's gonna be played by oscar Isaac. um i, I may have been picturing and i love him i love him already that he is this you know stoic ruler a little bit but also clearly very empathetic as well and has fallen for jessica and and they already have an understanding that she can 
trick him into changing his mind, but he's still going to try to argue with her first. It was like, that's a healthy relationship and I support it and it's hot. Um, Who are you picturing, Maud, for Duke Leto? Yeah. Oh, I just said it. Uh, probably um, subconsciously Jared because of the letter. I kept, uh, yeah. Yeah. Although. Listen, like long hair back in a low pony. <laughs> It's kind of, I think it's kind of amazing that the, the director of Blade Runner 2049 didn't imme- immediately do that either. And just like, it just cast Jared Leto in that role, but instead it went Oscar Isaac. No. I think- Thank uh, goodness. Ooh, that's but, Yeah, it, 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 I think it's a great acting or great casting choice, but he is probably my favorite, although I did love the Reverend Mother as a character, but Duke Leto has a couple of moments in this first section that are fantastic. And because I'm a sucker for father-son stories mm-hmm. and because- Brian in his introduction was kind of giving me that context of like, look, if me and my dad had a tough relationship at any point, I, w- I read Dune and the way that he talks about Duke mm-hmm. Leto talking about his son is, is that he was able to find some connections there that I thought mm-hmm. I, like that immediately got to me. So I know, some, yeah. Has, yeah, some great moments, a great father son relationship that is still not, um, even, even in all of this very futuristic and otherworldly setting, there's still things in there that are very relatable because you're like, oh, they don't communicate all that well. And yet there is- You feel the care, yeah. You feel the care, you feel the love. I also love the way that Frank Herbert describes Duke Leto as a leader, where like the, you know, the the, the omnipotent narration or other characters are commenting and they're like, I think even uh, Paul himself is like, and then my dad said the exact perfect thing he needed to say at the exact perfect time. It's Leto. Yep. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. Leto, I'm getting different things in the chat. Oh Who knows? Did you see that? Leto. I go, is it Leto or Leto? And then it was like, no. Leto. It's I think Leto. It's, it's Leto. I can't even remember now what was yeah. in the, the um, audio book, but let's see. Okay. I think gonna, the, the 84 movie was Duke Leto. We're going to get through the characters and then we're going to get through the series. Okay. And we, we can go a little bit over if everyone will make sure they go to the after show um, on Geek Bomb, which we'll cool. be talking about after this or you could call in call me maybe i don't know um but we're gonna go through all the characters so we can talk about what happened um because there is so much here and obviously we are super into it so mm-hmm. next is oh god to fear hawat yeah it's pretty good a mentat who is basically a human computer he is the trades master of assassins which is awesome uh mm-hmm. gurney Halleck, a troubadour warrior for the Atreides, will be played by oh, that's Thanos, cool. a.k.a. Josh Brolin. And I think, correct me if I'm wrong, I think that was Patrick Stewart in the 1984 movie, which is hilarious. Yes. Okay, yeah. great. No, yeah, um, <laughs> that is him. And then we have, uh, Mon, how did you, how is it in the audiobook? UA? In the audiobook is Yui. Yui, yeah. Dr. Yui, a doctor in service of the Atreides who we're told right from the start will betray them, which I love. Yes, and also and you know that, that his, a little bit more. His sister, end. yeah, okay. his sister. Okay. So he's trying to get revenge. Then we have in the audiobook. I haven't looked up who is voicing the audiobook character, but Duncan. Uh, Idaho. Oh, I skipped. Sorry, I was thinking about the Baron. Uh, Duncan Idaho is is Jason Momoa, which I already knew, and that's that's going to be fantastic. I didn't. Uh, know that. A sexy swordmaster. I added the sexy in service of the Atreides will be played by Jason Momoa. Yeah, like Again, as I said, hot character. But in the audiobook, the Baron Harkonnen, the leader of House Harkonnen, the nemesis to the Atreides through generations, who steps he's a voice out from actor. The sh- he plays the archangel in Diablo Three. Oh, oh, he's got. Such a good voice. I was the like, who is this? He's evil. I love him. Like I and he he emerges from the shadows like a real creep and a half. And also uh, I like the way Mod pronounced that Diablo three. I like that instead of Diablo. Diablo. No. Diablo is better. Um, <laughs> but this is this is as far as we know, the big bad. This is the you know, Capulet Montague of Atreides and Harkonnen mm-hmm. or mm-hmm. Stark and uh, or uh, te- Captain America, yeah. I'll you know you know all of it. Um, oh, I was thinking Game of Thrones, but yeah. Oh, um, oh okay. <laughs> uh, then we have whoop, there's a bug in my face. Um, Peter DeVries, uh, Mentat for the Harkonnens, who is also a great character. Super into him. Is that um, the voice of Chucky? What's his name? Do you know? Someone Google it. You know, what? Doug. Doug. No, it's all Moss too. 
it's going to be crazy. Someone in the chat tell me because I have to keep going. But um, then there's uh, the Baron's nephew. Someone else say it. I don't. Sting. Played by Sting. Claude, That's how I got to no. know. No, right. I Claude, know. what is it? No, I'm not talking about Chucky. Um, I feel like I found the actor of um, the voice actor for Baron uh, Harkonnen is Jonathan Adams. I'm pretty cool. sure. Pretty okay. cool. He is amazing. The Baron's nephew, who I don't know who's playing that in the movie. Don't tell me because we're going to get mm -hmm. through it. I hope it's just Sting Rauta again. I hope they just Harkonnen. bring him back. <laughs> um, then we have the shout out mates. Yeah. Mates. A, yeah. free, a freeman who works for the Atreides. Mm -hmm. um Silgar leader of a Freeman community that is known as the Siege and I think oh, Stilgar is going to be oh I'm so like Javier Bardem oh really yeah still when Stilgar showed up when Stilgar photo. showed up at, at the end of this section I was like hell yeah Stilgar is mm -hmm. dope <laughs> yeah so so just getting into what actually happened we we meet Paul we know that just from the get-go when he's sleeping and the Lady Jessica and the, um, uh, she comes in and basically you learn that he is this, he could be a chosen one. We learn that Lady Jessica was supposed to have only daughters, that there is this sort of secret society, the Benny Jessica of women who are married off to different or, or concubines or what have you. They don't know where they come from necessarily in case they're related to the guy they need to smooch up with, mm -hmm. upsetting. Um, they're, they're basically pulling the strings behind the scenes to make sure that things work as they should. I don't know yet if things as they should is a good thing or not, which I find very interesting. Um, but basically they're getting ready to go to the planet Dune to um, take over from their, you know, frenemy arch nemeses, the Harkonnens, where they're sort of in this cold war of, we know we want to destroy each other, but you can't do it too outright, but you want to know that if, if the Duke is assassinated, we want, we want credit for that. Yeah. That yeah. is exactly what it's like in The Legend of Drizzt with the drow houses. You cannot blatantly kill them, but if you sneak in the night, wipe them all out and right. leave no survivors, it is like held in an esteem and then the house um, hierarchy actually well, shifts. I think the comparisons that a lot of folks have made between that, between Game of Thrones, it's that feudal system, right? You're a lord until you're not, until your yep. land is taken, until someone outsmarts yep. you. Yep. And so as the Atreides family, as we get to know all these awesome characters are getting ready to go to Arrakis, which has this, you know, resource that not only the emperor is after, there's the spice guild that's used for space travel. There's no, there's, it's a whole water resource thing. The people who live there, the Freemans are basically having their own planet and resources tapped out for the rich people. I don't know how we could relate to this in this modern era. It's mm. crazy. 100 uh, men for it's, 20 trees. And it's it's this really awesome, like this first section of the book is such a great setup to be the lack of water. And, and through Paul, we're learning like, okay, you've been training in all of these different things and you're obviously very smart and precocious, but you've never been without anything that you've ever needed. We've got all of these, you know, date trees and everything that should be, you know, should feed a thousand men or what, it's the wrong number, but you know, it's, it's not actually for this many people. It's for this royal family who will be protected theoretically mm -hmm. from the harsh realities of living on Arrakis. And- Was it Jessica in that sequence, in that scene that said, Oh yes, but some people might be mad, but also the, the trees bring hope to other people that there's yeah, hope no, that there. was um Doctor No no it uh Oh Jessica? she was hopeful and Doctor yeah. Yeah. You, yeah. you 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 yeah. not, not great about it. He was just yeah. like saying that this was insulting because they're prioritizing yeah. this lush sort of like tree that isn't even in season and the dates aren't even gonna drop because and it's sucking all the water out and it's like the humans are treated as a secondary citizen to mm -hmm. that. Um, yeah. I would really love to get into how this book is written. And 
in the psychology kind of way of things. I'm really enjoying how Frank is switching between perspectives. And it's like, mm -hmm. if Jessica is having a conversation, you know exactly what she's thinking. Yeah. And nice. then, uh, who she's talking to and who, uh, whoever's receiving what she's saying, you hear exactly what they're thinking. So you have so much intel and insight into everyone's deep desires or their way of thinking or what they're taking in and what they're observing. And that's one of my favorite sort of omniscient perspectives that. where you, you get what you need from the characters and what they're feeling, but there's also a lot of mystery left to figure out what is going on with others. Um, mm -hmm. Because usually when I, it's from only one particular viewpoint, and I, I would have thought that it would have been Paul in this instance, because when he was sort of like going about his mm -hmm. day, he would be like, oh, I felt that this was a little bit weird this particular moment. And that's kind mm -hmm. of all you would get in, mm -hmm. in any other book. You would get, this didn't feel right. Or I yeah. noticed that their face shifted in that no, particular but people, moment. But others are, are feeling that as well, especially... Men yeah, it'll be like, this is why my yeah. face moved in an um, you mm -hmm. know, unnatural way because I'm trying to hide this or I'm thinking this. I love, uh, yeah, it's like, yeah. I wish I more people the book were like that because my brain does that where I'm like, oh, that person did this with their face and that's what that means. And, and then, you know, other folks who are maybe more just chill and less neurotic, <laughs> but will be like, oh yeah, I didn't think that you're upset. And I'm like, I, I just went through a million options in my brain of Good. Was that the book breaking a hole in your floor? <laughs> oh, good. Eh? Jeez. It didn't spill. So. Well, Look, here's a great comment to... from Rachel Beaver. Rachel Beaver says, I do like how there was more than one perspective. And uh, she also says, my second favorite quote from this section, if wishes were fishes, we'd all cast nets. Yes. That was, yeah. And then saying, oh, but I can't actually use that phrase because where we're going, there are no <laughs> There's no fish at all. So this yeah. is completely irrelevant <laughs> we don't need fish where we're going i mean they I'm, do need fish, i'm but. really looking forward to seeing how with my overall framework having watched the 1984 film how the book is going to treat the fremen that are on the planet arrakis that are on dune because there's there if if, if we're d delving into the worlds of metaphor um you know and it's what a, science fiction above, does so we actually yep. absolutely are yeah yep and what science fiction does where it will you know take a sci-fi concept but it's really talking about some real world stuff this feels like it is about the dangers of capitalism uh and how a sort of invading force will deal with a native population so yeah. i'm really looking forward to seeing how the fremen are going to continue to be like depicted because the scene where uh oh my gosh what's the character's name uh the javier bardem character uh who was like the one of the yeah. leaders of the fremen yes. um stilgar um, stilgar yeah where he shows up and he's treated with so much reverence from um that one dude who Duncan is gonna Idaho? Get, Duncan Idaho, who's gonna get mm -hmm. sent by Duke uh, Duke Leto to like go and, and be a part of their group and, and fight with them. And he already that. is, I love that. And, and and just thinking sociologically about there are good intentions from some of these characters so far, yeah. and then there are obviously evil ones, but also just any kind of system of power. Yeah. And this is something that my dad is a labor lawyer and loves Marxism. So fun times were like talking about, you know, systems of power when I was a kid. But um, the idea that any, any system, capitalism, communism, socialism, et cetera, could be beneficial as an abstract. It is people that really take advantage of it or make it evil or different yeah. things like that. None of them are perfect. None of them work 100%. There's probably a world in which, you know, they could work together, but people are the reason that people are the very go south because, and you can mm -hmm. take that from a, you know, macro level of mm -hmm. an entire community or the world or globalism, anything. And you can take that to interpersonal relationships of people can have the best intentions or think they're doing the right thing and be so completely wrong and not thinking about what's going on. So I'm, I'm super excited. Avery Adventurous also said third person omniscient, which I wanted to say, but I was like, I'm not sure if that's actually what it is because I've had mm -hmm. wine and I don't want to be wrong. It's really difficult to write and it's done so yeah. well in this book. And yeah, I agree. I love, I love that. 
And I wonder, like Hector, we've spoken about how we, uh, where we are in the room when we're reading what's going on. And I felt like I was, sorry, but Navi the fairy in Legend of Zelda, where I was just literally flitting and floating above their shoulders, like getting the insight and then like going back and absorbing what was happening. But it was was done so effortlessly that I thought that that was so spectacular. Something that I would like to bring up from this book was something that I had been very aware of for a very, very long time and didn't know where it was from or what it was about. There is a video game called NetHack and I played it when I was about six or seven years of age. So that was like early in the 90s. Um, And this, I think, game was created in the mid 80s. And one of the best weapons you could find was a Chris knife. And I had no idea why. And I was like, what is a Chris knife? Like a Chris knife kind of thing. And the sandworm too, which I always think of these sandworms from Beetlejuice. But I love, I love this. And also in the Vanity Fair spread of um, the Dune images that we saw, there's, if you go to Nerdist, there's sort of a breakdown of those types of weapons. But I thought that was super dope. And just the passing it along to, from women to women, I'm super into that. Yeah, I had like a nomadic feel because it's like weapon, boom. Yeah. Uh, I love the fact that this is something that I have been introduced to as a child and only now I'm discovering the origin of it all. Like that's sick. Absolutely, yeah, I'm, I'm really digging it so far and I, I feel like I have this with every um, book club that we do that we have been doing um, for many years where I like, everything so much more after talking about it with you two, Mod and Hector, and everyone who's joining us. And I'm just, it's its just how I feel. But um, I'm really excited to be diving into this with everyone. And everyone who's watching, if we didn't get to you in the chat, we're going to let you know other ways that you can join us. But um, man, we could, we could go for hours on this show, honestly. But we're going to, now that we've introduced everyone to the world and we sort of understand where we are, who some of the main characters are and how that framework sort of works as far as we know so far. Um, We can really get into it in the next couple of weeks. And you can always go to Nerdist.com. Some of our amazing dude writers are doing, you know, what is spice? What does it mean if you, like some of us want to just research the heck out of this book? Um, where and, can we get it? How much does it cost? What yeah. happens to us when we try it? Yeah, Those what, kinds of what, questions. what kind of trip is that? Um, <laughs> <laughs> the menage. But um, so for next week, this one's easier than last time because we, we have three different books within the book and uh, we'll be sharing on Twitter in different places if you're reading our copy, if you're listening to the audio book, if you have some of the old paperbacks, we'll do whatever we can to make it clear when it is confusing. But next week, super easy. Finish the first book of Dune, which is called Dune. What dib? What? What dib? Mod, uh, mod dib. There you go. Um, and uh, thank you so much again to pay. Honestly, I, this is such a, I mean, such a beautiful book so thank you so much to penguin for these beautiful hardcovers that we have that we are going to treasure there for all are of a lot of reasons why we have decided to do june for this particular time not only is there a brand new uh look of the book that you can order which looks spectacular but we haven't got a trailer yet but there are first looks of the new june movie so now is probably the best time and it's like a bit of a no-brainer if you're a book club to cover June at this particular time. So we really thank you for joining us with all of this. There are the book clubs that have covered June as well. So if you want to just learn everything because everyone's got a different perspective. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Cool. We covered it. Amy Ratcliffe, um, I know. lovely, I lovely I human. I and- used Amy's referral notes. So I read the book and then I went online <laughs> and I saw that Amy had written about this in 2015. Yeah, on Nerdist, yeah. All of her notes and her Look. passion talking about this. Uh, so it's like she's, she's such been, a huge fan. And she also it has been doing a series with Goodreads as well through many of those books. Um, she is such an amazing resource. And uh, Hector, you will love Lindsay Romaine's work. A, she's a an amazing writer and editor she's and the best. covers she's a lot the best. of horror and everything. But she got into these books through the movies and has been also, she did our 
cool spice explainer, but we're any, any way that you can get into this, share us links, send us videos, send us, you know, anything you want, Twitter, Goodreads, wherever. We're going to keep the conversation going. Yeah. But thank you to the Hideaway mm -hmm. Wine Company for sending us delicious wines while we read. This is very exciting. We feel very special that you sent us yes. wine. Um, if you are watching this and you are of legal drinking age, which in the United States is 21, uh, you can find out more about their wines at thehideawaylo.com. In you Australia, also, it's 18. <laughs> I, I'm, oh, it's, cool. it's 18 a lot of places. And um, I, that's where I will stop that conversation. Uh, <laughs> you can also check out uh, previous episodes of Nerdist Book Club on Nerdist and Geek and Sundry's YouTube or Geek and Sundry's Twitch. Like and subscribe. We're doing lots of fun things. We have a lot of things in the works from our homes. We're very just grateful that anyone uh, is spending their quarantine, TM Hector Navarro, uh, with us because we're all at home and you know we love this community between all of our you know friends and and supporters personally, Nerdist, Geek Bomb, DC Daily, Geek and Sundry, everything. We really appreciate that we can come together and drink wine and talk about books and not and think I, about books. Yeah, I think our motivation and motto for um, establishing geek uh, book club, sorry, especially with all three of us has been that the more book clubs there are, the more people that are discussing books and sharing that love and they're in this community, everyone wins. Like, I feel like, I don't know when it happened, but books kind of dipped off a little bit. And it's like, oh, yeah, bring it back. let's come back to like, what's really, really great to talk about. So yeah, it's all about the community. Absolutely. And it's, you know, for the past few years that we've been doing this, we have really, I mean, we've made our friendships, which I'm not going to cry yet. We just started, but our friendships, Episode our, fr <laughs> our, our, our friendships online with everyone who has joined, but also for me getting recommendations from people or people taking my recommendations or opening up my mind. So it's super exciting. Um, Maude, tell us where we're going next. That's it. It doesn't stop here. Um, we have an exclusive kind of after show that happens on Geek Bomb because Geek Bomb is as obsessed with books with a little thing called power, which is playing, watching and reading. Reading being a big component. Rachel and Hector and I are going to jump over to the Geek Bomb Discord every single, we used to be every single month we covered a book, but we jump onto a call. So you guys actually get to talk with us and ask questions. And we have a really amazing Q and A to extend this conversation. Um, it is a, a perk that is on the Geek Bomb Patreon. So if you jump over to patreon.com slash geek bomb, it is the lowest tier. So the lowest tier that we have available, you get access to the Discord and you can chat with us and hang out every single after show of the Nerdist Book Club. So we're going to head there right now. Thanks to all that community who's so amazing as well and who are so great with their questions. We have intelligent discussion and it's amazing. Yeah. Thank you everyone for joining us for the first of six weeks of Dune. We're going to get deep into it. Send us your questions, send us your thoughts. If you think that you are the one person who knows the pronunciation for a certain name, <laughs> just let us know. We, you know, we're trying our best, but let us know. Hashtag Nerdist Book Club. You know where to find us all on the internet. Send us your ideas for the next book on Goodreads, and uh, we'll see you next week. Hopefully, we'll see you and talk to you in five minutes. But thank you so much for joining us, and uh, see you next week. Yep, that's all I got. Bye.